John Lilly is one of the most interesting and also one of the most influential um, of the generation of writers and playwrights immediately before Shakespeare. He's about 10 years older than Shakespeare. Um, comes from, in some ways, a more socially elevated kind of background. His grandfather was the founder of the St Paul's Grammar School, a um, very great kind of humanist scholar, um, whose um, grammar instruction book carried on being used for centuries afterwards. Lily's Grammar is this incredibly kind of famous, um, famous text in the period. And Lily's uncle and his father um, were also kind of minor sort of humanist figures and get progressively more involved with the administration of Canterbury Cathedral. So Lily is born in, um, in Canterbury, um, almost certainly went to um, the King's Grammar School in Canterbury, um, and then follows his grandfather and his uncle to um, Morden College, Oxford. Um, and as a young man, actually tries and kind of plays to have a fellowship granted to him at Magdalen, but this falls through. And so like a lot of, of ambitious young men from the grammar schools, he heads to London and he ends up doing kind of literary activities. And so the first of his literary activities we know about is a prose text, um, kind of a, a predecessor of the novel um, in some ways, um, called Euphues, um, which is published um, in um, 1578 and is an absolute sensation. Um, it goes through multiple editions. It spawns a sequel, um, Euphues and his England. And it really becomes this absolute cliche that Lily is the person who teaches Englishmen a new way to write um, and English men and women a kind of new way to think at this point. And then he goes into the theatre and ends up writing, um, in many ways, some of the most influential plays of their period and certainly the most influential comedies of their period. Lily's entry into the theatre really comes via um, his major patron, um, certainly in the first part of his career, um, who's the Earl of Oxford. And Lily, I think, originally makes contact with the Earl of Oxford through Oxford's father-in-law, William Cecil, Lord Burley. Um, and Lily has quite tenuous but quite useful family connections with Lord Burley. Um, and he seems to get this connection with Oxford through those kinds of connections. Now, Oxford um, is ambitious, but is also of um, uncertain temperament. And at the point when he and Lily seem to come together, Oxford has been banished from Elizabeth's court. Um, he's banished in 1580, doesn't make a return until 1583. And when he does, his reappearance at court coincides with the performance of two plays by Lily at court, um, Camp Aspey and Sappho and Fayo, in 1583 and 1584. And this seems to be part of a concentrated campaign on Oxford's part to get back into Elizabeth's favour, not just through political or social means, but through artistic means as well. Boys' companies, I think, are one of the most intriguing phenomena of this period, that we tend to think of them as a kind of strange oddity. We tend to link them in our minds with a certain kind of precociousness, a certain kind of either stage school or, or kind of school school play kinds of performances. And I think that's misleading. Um, children's performance is central to theatrical culture in the 16th century in a way that it's never really been since the 17th century. Um, so children take part in civic pageants, they take part in royal entertainments, and they take part in plays. And one of the things that happens in the course of the 16th century is that groups of children and um, boy actors get progressively more involved in court um, court culture and court performances. And so groups from the grammar schools and the choir schools are invited to perform in front of Elizabeth I. And various schoolmasters um, write plays, train boys to perform these particular kinds of plays, um, and they're very popular. Now, the reasons why they're popular, I think, are, are kind of debatable but also interesting. That one of the theories is that there is a kind of fascination in the miniature. So this idea that you have these boys acting adult roles. And so there's a kind of, a slight irony or a slight kind of parody involved, or maybe a kind of slightly uncanny power in the performances of these boys playing adult roles in ways that are convincing, yet also fundamentally artificial at the same time. And the other reason why I said it was um, misleading to think in terms of, of contemporary school plays is that these children, these boys, are very highly trained. 
Um, so they would have been at at least the standard of professional adult acts at the time, if not actually more so, um, because they're being trained in a much more concentrated kind of way. Oxford's connections with the boys' companies um, in some ways are slightly shadowy. Um, and as with a lot of these things, we know about it because it ends up in lawsuits. So um, a theatre in the Black Friars is established um, in the late 1570s, so in the winter of 1576-77, um, around the time when the amphitheatre is also being established in other parts of London. Um, so there's a move to kind of institutionalise the theatre in some ways. Um, and Richard Farrant leases premises in the Blackfriars, so in old monastery land, and initially says that he wants to use this for training, um, for teaching his choristers. And Farrant has connections with um, both the Chapel Royal at Windsor and the main Chapel Royal in London. Um, and so he's training these boys to, to perform. But he starts to put on semi-public performances as well, to which people can pay. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, the person who owns the lease of these buildings isn't very keen on this, tries to reject Farrant in 1580, and his, he dies the same year. Um, his wife then inherits the lease and then sublets to William Hunnis, who is the choir master at the main Chapel Royal. Um, and then Hunnis, um, in 1583, passes the lease over to a man called Henry Evans. And Henry Evans then passes it to Oxford. Um, so Oxford gets the lease on this converted set of rooms um, in the early 1580s and seems to bring Lily in um, as the kind of main playwright. Um, quite how involved Lily is in actually running the company is really difficult to tell, I think, at this move. He's certainly writing for them. He's certainly directing things in some ways. Later on, there are various jibes at Lily. Um, that he is very heavily involved in the actual um, running of the companies in some ways. And this is later on when he's working with a different company. Um, but there is this kind of uncertainty. Um, Oxford um, is a minor poet, um, thought to have also been a playwright as well. He's included in various lists of, of people who wrote plays um, in the 1590s. None of his plays have survived. He's listed very highly, um, or very high in the ranks when people list playwrights, but that's almost certainly because of his social rank rather than because of the worth. Although actually some of his, his lyric poetry isn't bad. Um, it's, it's kind of formulaic, it fits into a certain kind of pattern, but th there's a certain kind of ability there. So possibly Oxford also wrote for these companies that, that bore his name, um, but we don't have any surviving texts, unfortunately. We know a certain amount about the structure of the, the first Blackfriars, although one of the problems with the indoor theatres of this period is that they don't leave archaeological traces in the same way that the um, amphitheatres do. So, for instance, if you have a theatre that's on the first floor or the second floor of a building and the building's no longer there, the foundations that the building aren't going to tell you very much about the playhouse or, or what it was like. So in contrast with the amphitheatres where we have this very interesting archaeological record, for the indoor playhouses we're much more um, dependent on what people said about the playhouse at the time. So we think we know roughly whereabouts the first Blackfriars was. We think it was in the um, rooms that were used as, as the buttery of the old monastery, which is where Apothecary's Hall now is. Um, so we now have a, a later building on the site of, of that building itself. We know roughly what its dimensions were. Um, so it was around um, 46 by 26 feet. But that was the space that Farrant, when he built it, had at his disposal. We don't know precisely how it was set out. We don't even really know how many people it fitted into it. Um, all we can do really is draw comparisons with the other indoor playhouses. So the largest of the indoor playhouses, the, the Blackfriars, probably fitted around, between around 800 and 1500, depending on how many galleries you think that that playhouse had. The theatre that the Children of Paul's used, one of the recent estimates is that that might have fitted as few as 50 people. So there's really quite a, a broad range of, of sizes. Um, my instinct says that the first Black Friars was probably towards the smaller end of that, partly because it's a, a slightly um, exploratory kind of enterprise when it's first set up. Um, I don't think that Farron would have risked building something that fitted a lot of people into it. Um, and obviously, if your total space is 46 feet by 26 feet, 
even without health and safety, you're not going to fit huge amounts of, of, of people into it. Um, so apart from that, we're really dependent on, on information from the place itself and from later playhouses. Um, so it probably had a thrust stage. It probably had doors in the back of the stage. Um, but beyond that, I don't think that we know a huge amount about it. Yeah, the Paul's Playhouse um, is in operation for quite a lot longer than the first Blackfriars Playhouse. Um, it's constructed around the same time, so around 1575, um, by Sebastian Westcott, um, who's the master of the um, choristers um, at Paul's at the time. And Paul's is slightly confusing in that you have the, the choir and you have the grammar school. And they're both heavily involved in theatrical production at various points. Now, we think that the group that Lily was working with was the choristers rather than the grammar scholars, but it's not always easy to tell exactly where that line, that line divides. Um, so the most recent work that's been done on the um, St Paul's Theatre suggests that it was very small indeed, that it may have fitted as few as 50 people into it. So a very kind of small, very intimate kind of space. Um, but it's used from the 1570s through to the um, early 1600s, so it seems to be around between about 1606 to 1608 that it falls out of use. And actually, interestingly, in um, I think it's around 1609, 1610, the manager of one of the other companies makes a bargain with the manager of the Paul's Playhouse at that point that he's not going to reopen it, that he's going to keep it shut. So it's very tiny, but it's still in some ways a form of competition, um, which is fascinating, I think. The question of the audience for the boys' companies is a very interesting one. Um, we know that they were more expensive to get into than the amphitheatres. So there was almost certainly um, a certain social exclu exclusivity created by the higher cost. On the other hand, some people who go to um, performances um, in the grammar schools and also in, in these um, choristers' theatres complain about riffraff being allowed in. So maybe they're not as exclusive as it's sometimes thought to be. Um, there's a kind of convenient legal fiction that performances at the first Blackfriars and the Paul's Playhouse, certainly in the 1570s and 80s and very early 1590s, are um, rehearsals for court performances. Um, but it's difficult to know quite how seriously to take this claim, whether it is just a kind of convenient fiction. Um, on the other hand, obviously, it would have been useful to have tried out plays in front of an audience before you take them to, to Queen Elizabeth and before you take them to this, this very kind of critical and, and kind of testing kind of audience. Um, although I suspect the audiences in the Blackfriars and Pauls might well have been more attentive than court audiences. Sappho and Feo is probably Lily's second play, so after Camp Aspie. Um, and both of these plays are comedies. Both of them were performed at court um, in 1583 and 1584, respectively. And they do seem to be written with an eye to court. In some ways, they're both about rulers, and they're both about rulers being assaulted by love, which is very interesting in the context of Elizabeth I, um, the fact that, obviously, in the 1580s, she was still unmarried. And the early 1580s is, in some ways, the at the point when people are beginning to think, well, actually, she's never, this is not going to happen, she's not going to get married. Um, and so these plays in which rulers defeat love have a certain kind of resonance, I think, in that particular cultural context. Sappho and Feo is particularly interesting, um, in part because of the way that Lily combines particular sorts of sources. So he draws um, a lot of the basics of the Sappho and Feo story from classical narratives, um, particularly from Ovid, and, and the Ovidian influence on Lily is something that's, that's very often been remarked on, partly in terms of the subject matter, but partly in terms of the, the kind of witty and kind of playful tone that Lily characteristically adopts in his comedies. Um, but he also draws on later traditions and really kind of widespread, rather misogynist kind of scepticism about Sappho particularly. Um, at the period when Lily's writing, the idea of Sappho being lesbian isn't really that widely known. Um, the narrative that's come down to them much, too, much more strongly is that, firstly, that Sappho was a poet, and second, that she loved Feo. Um, and they knew that one of the classical sources described her as, as kind of lovely or desirable. 
But weirdly, this kind of transmutes into a tradition that Sappho was ugly, but was very good at lovemaking, and so therefore attracted, attracted people. Um, the Sappho and Fairy narrative itself is about, well, in many versions, is about this older, less physically attractive woman who falls head and shoulders in love with this man who was an old ferryman who has been given back his youth and beauty and who um, basically makes all the women around fall in love with him. And in some versions of the narrative, he's eventually murdered by the husbands of all of the women um, who fall in love with him. Now, Lily doesn't use that version, but quite often with Lily, there's a kind of a shadow of all of these different versions, kind of running underneath the version that he's decided to tell. So in Lily's version, Sappho is a lovely, um, beautiful, um, virginal queen um, who, under the influence of Venus, falls headlong in love with Phaeo, who has been restored or given kind of great beauty at the beginning of the narrative. But it also differs from these, these classical narratives and the later traditions that kind of accrue onto them because in this version, Sappho in the end conquers love and she kidnaps Cupid from Venus. And so at the end of the play, um, Phaeo is forsaken and Sappho is now in charge of Cupid and Cupid's arrows. And she says of Cupid's bow that from now on, it will be a toy made for ladies um, rather than this thing that's victimizing women or kind of pushing them into foolish behaviors. Lily's plays are often viewed as allegories, and they're often considered um, to have a kind of allegorical meaning to them. So the idea that Lily's, um, particularly female characters, have particular um, connections with court figures, and particularly with Elizabeth herself. And there have been um, various scholars who've, who've read the plays in those terms and have looked at the kind of the analogues of Elizabeth, so these, these female rulers, um, particularly these kind of virginal female rulers who do crop up in, in Lily's plays. Um, I think one of the problems with reading Lily's plays allegorically is it simplifies them. I think actually they're more interesting than that would, would, would suggest. And so even though there are moments in a play like Sappho and Phaeo where Sappho is, I think, designed to make you think of Elizabeth, I don't think that works consistently across the whole narrative. And I suspect that if it did work consistently across the whole narrative, Lily would actually have been in some trouble. Because one of the things we see in Sappho and Phaeo is these comic set pieces in which Sappho is, is talking about her, her love for Phaeo. And actually very kind of erotic sequences in which she's fantasizing um, about Phaeo. And of course that's troubled scholars who've wanted to see Sappho as a kind of direct Elizabeth I analog. So I think at that point in the narrative, it doesn't really work to think of it as straightforward allegory. Um, so allegory in the way that, say, Spencer's Fairy Queen very clearly allegorizes Elizabeth. Um, but I think the final moments of the play, where Sappho conquers love and where she takes over Cupid's bow, does set up certain connections between Sappho as the queen who has conquered love and Elizabeth herself in the 1580s as potentially the female ruler who is not subject to love but who actually controls it. Lily's language is something that has always fascinated scholars working on, on Lily, and actually something that's fascinated um, commentators on Lily going right back to the um, 16th and 17th centuries. One of the most influential things that Lily does is, is to kind of stamp a particular style, um, which becomes known as euphuism. And in some ways, the idea of euphuism has been overemphasized. It's been turned into this very kind of static kind of, of, of set of cliches in some ways. But there are certain characteristics and certain um, characteristic things that Lily does with language. Um, there's a wonderful line when um, Edward Blunt um, reprints Lily's plays in the 1630s. Um, he comments that in the Elizabethan period, um, all our ladies were then his scholars and that beauty at court that could not parlay euphuism was as little regarded as she now there that speaks no French. And Blunt's talking about the Caroline court in the 1630s where under the influence of Henrietta Maria, everybody wants to learn French and everybody wants to read French literature. And he's suggesting there's such a cult um, you know, amongst particularly women um, for Lily's way of writing. Now, euphuism, very, very broadly, is a way of writing that's structured around antithesis. So a kind of, on the one hand, this, 
on the one hand, that um, way of constructing um, sentences, but also kind of broader structures as well. Um, so it uses that. It tends to use a lot of um, play on the way that particular words sound. So we get lots of alliteration in Lily, lots of assonance in Lily, lots of kind of playing around with words that sound similar. And that idea of play is absolutely crucial. So Lily's dialogue, his language, is absolutely characterised by wit and by kind of playfulness. Um, and this, I think, really works with a group of boy actors, that the, the language itself actually isn't as complicated as it looks. The vast majority of Lily's plays are in prose. Only one of his plays, The Woman in the Moon, is written in blank verse. Um, and I think the patterning actually helps in terms of the boy actors being able to learn the lines, but also to deliver them convincingly. And schooling in the period that we're talking about was very based on rhetoric and was very based on being able to speak and being able to speak well. So because Lily's plays delight so much in language, they really, I think, play to the strengths of, of the actors who are performing them. There is a tendency for people to say poor old John Lilly and to view his career as a kind of very rapid rise and then a kind of swift decline. Um, and I think like a lot of narratives, it's, it's kind of attractive in terms of being a narrative, but it doesn't quite work, I think, if, if you look a bit more at the, at the specifics of, of what he wrote and when he wrote it. Um, so Lilly does have these, these kind of spikes in his career, these moments when everything seems to work for him. So in the very late, late 1570s, when Euphues and its sequel uh, um, are published, um, in the mid-1580s, when he's doing these plays at court with, with, with Oxford, um, and then in the later 1580s, when he's working with the children of Paul's and doing um, plays like Endymion um, and Mother Bombay. Um, and then there's, there's been a tendency to talk about a, a decline after that. The Woman in the Moon, which seems to be his last play, has sometimes been thought to be an attempt at writing for the adult companies that doesn't work. And this, I think, is largely because it's written in, in blank verse rather than in, in, um, in prose. Um, but its most recent editor, Leah Scragg, has argued very strongly that actually we should think of it as a children's company play. And it's more likely to be a play written for the children of Pauls um, in the very late 1580s or, or circa 1590. One of the misfortunes that Lily does um, fall into at that point in the late 1580s is that he gets um, drawn into what's often known as the Marprelate scandal. And this is really a dispute between different factions within English Protestantism. So people who feel that the structures within the Church of England don't work properly, and so write tracts against um, the bishops and against the kind of the structures within the church that depend on having authority figures like the bishops. Um, and these are printed on secret presses and kind of circulate in a very clandestine way. And one of the things the authorities do to work against this is they actually get imaginative writers involved to write counter pamphlets. Um, and Lily and Thomas Nash are some of the people who are involved here. And Lily um, so writes some non-dramatic pamphlets, um, notably one called Pamp with a Hatchet, um, but also seems to have been involved in getting plays put on by the children of Pauls that satirise the Marprelet um, tracts. And the children of Paul seems to get shut down around 1590. Um, they disappear for a while. When some of Lily's plays are published around this time, the printers talk about the fact that since the plays in Paul's have been stopped, we're now bringing them out in print for you. So Lily's career really kind of takes a knock at that point. Um, he also seems to have made, been made promises that weren't kept. So in a letter um, to, written to Queen Elizabeth, probably in 1598, he um, asks about her promise that he say, he admits was made verbally rather than actually being put in writing, um, but her promise to give him um, the reversion of the office of the Master of the Revels. And this means that he was going to be next in line or next in line but one to become Master of the Revels when the then current Master of the Revels retired. Now, unfortunately for Lily, the Mastership of the Revels goes into the hands of a powerful faction at court, which is opposed to the faction that he's more connected with. And so this never happens. But it's very interesting, the Master of the Revels was the, um, the dramatic censor and also planned court performances. So Lily was really aiming at a very powerful 
kind of position here and thought that he had a very good claim on it, but this doesn't work out for him. So in the 1590s, he's exploring other kind of avenues. Um, he first becomes an MP in 1589, and then again, um, actually I think in different, um, I was going to say constituencies, that's not quite the right word, but in different places um, in the 1590s. Um, and he's involved in um, inns of court revels in the 1590s as well. Um, but he does, he does drop out of sight slightly, but his plays don't. His plays, um, when the children's companies come back in 1599 and 1600, they revive some of his plays. So Love's Metamorphosis is revived, probably 10 or so years after its first performance. Um, and people even at this point are talking about um, Lily as this kind of exemplar. There's a wonderful line from Barnaby Rich, who says that Lily could um, court it with the best and scholar it with the most. And the children's companies, when they're revived, pick up on Lillian techniques and Lillian dramaturgy. Um, so I think it's, it's a mistake, really, to see it as, as necessarily a simple decline narrative. There's lots of things going on there. I don't think it's going too far to say that Lily's comedies are the most influential um, of the um, 16th century partly because of the influence they have on figures such as Shakespeare, but also Ben Jonson, also John Marston, um, also in some ways I think Thomas Middleton, so figures who go on to have an influence of their own. So Lily in some ways has a kind of primary influence and then a kind of knock-on, a kind of secondary influence that kind of runs through. Um, so in terms of Shakespeare, there are some very direct connections between Lily's works and Shakespeare's works. And one of the really interesting things is that the point at which Shakespeare's company, the Chamberlain's Men, really start investing in romantic comedy seems to be the point at which the children's companies are shut down. Um, and it's been argued, I think, really quite convincingly, that one of the things the Chamberlain's Men do is they make a play for that audience that no longer has Lily's plays to satisfy them. And so people see, um, or I think it's very... Um, very valid to see Shakespeare's romantic comedies of the 1590s, and particularly things like Midsummer Night's Dream, As You Like It, coming out of this very strong Lillian influence and using it very self-consciously. And plays such as Midsummer Night's Dream and As You Like It have very strong narrative and dramaturgical connections with the kinds of things that Lily pioneered. So As You Like It in particular, with its play on the boy who is the girl who is disguised as a boy, which obviously is actually a boy actor playing a girl who is then playing a boy, has its roots in, in Galatea, um, in which Lily has two um, choir boy actors playing two girls um, who are disguised as two boys. And a play like Twelfth Night kind of draws us draws on this even more. So one of the things that happens in Galatea is the two girls who are disguised as two boys fall in love with each other. Um, but each of them suspects that the other might be what they are. And so they have these teasing dialogues in which they're trying to work out whether the other is actually a young man or whether the other is actually a young woman and quite what will happen. So this kind of playing around with kind of gender, with sexuality, um, and a very kind of playful approach, a very witty approach to these kind of questions, I think is something that, that Shakespeare inherits, um, inherits from Lily. Um, and then I guess the other real um, huge influence that Lily has is in what the revived children's companies do around the turn of the 17th century. And so when the children of Paul's are reactivated and then the children of the, the, children of the chapel are reactivated, they put on plays by Marston and Johnson which play around with the whole idea of, of, of boy actors performing plays and have these wonderfully kind of teasing induction sequences where you have boy actors playing boy actors, talking about the difficulty of learning their lines and, 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 and actually performing their roles. Um, and one of the things that, that Marston and Johnson are doing is suggesting that actually they need to kind of re-establish the, the tradition again. And one of the ways they do this is, is by looking back to Lily. So Marston's Antonia Melida, Johnson's Cynthia's Revels, plays which almost certainly kind of kicked off those revived children's companies, are directly playing with Lillian kind of patterns and, and, and kind of playful yet interrogative kind of ways of writing comedy. And this, I think, then rolls into the next generation of, of children's company dramatists. So people like Thomas Middleton, for example, who then go on to have their own, their own kind of influence running on in, into the 1630s and 40s.
Lily is very unfairly neglected. Um, one of the things that I've found over the last few years in going to stage readings of Lily's plays is that they lift off the page. Um, there may be things that look complex when we read them. And actually look complex because I think we're unused to reading dramatic prose from that period in quite the same way that we read blank verse. I think we're put off by the fact that they don't quite sound like Shakespeare. They don't look like Shakespeare when we read them. Um, but as I say, they really do lift off the page. And what looks like well, the aspects that make them look difficult, so the patterning in particular, actually becomes something which has a kind of dramatic potential in itself and has this kind of playful quality in, performances, in performance. And one of the things that surprised me is that I've seen um, either stage readings or bits of Lily's plays done by adult performers and done by boy actors. And they work beautifully in both formats. So one of the things about Lily's plays is that they're often caricatured as plays that are utterly dependent on boys' company performance and utterly dependent on that kind of artificiality or ironic distance between actor and role. And actually, they don't really depend on those. Um, they are actually very, very funny. And some of them, um, Woman in the Moon, Lily's kind of probably his last play, is almost like bedroom farce in places. Um, very witty, very skillful kind of bedroom farce, but bedroom farce nonetheless. <laughs>